Hello, I'm Abigail Trafford, and today we're going to talk about the 2012 Farm Bill, subsidies, food assistance, and America's health. You know, in short, we are what we eat, and we eat what's available and what's affordable. And the overarching question is, is can legislation, and this Farm Bill in particular, shape eating patterns to improve the nation's health? But before we get to that, we've got to go through uh, a thicket of, of, of issues. One is we're going to talk about subsidies, the subsidies to sustain the agricultural industry, who wins, who loses. We're going to talk about food assistance to sustain the poor, who wins, who loses. And then connect the dots, in a sense, to the grand health question of improving the nation's health. It's fitting we're talking about this today because on Monday it's a National Food Day. It's also fitting because the Farm Bill is the hot political issue in Washington. That's the good news and the bad news. Uh, we have certain realities, which are the political realities. We live uh, in a very uncertain time financially. And so uh, the Obama administration has asked for $33 billion worth of cuts. The super committee on the bill has asked for $23 billion in cuts. So we're sort of talking about doing more with less. So we need smart dollars, smart food, and better health. We have a terrific panel to talk about these issues. We have Walter Willett. He's chair of the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health. We have David Ludwig. He's professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and also a professor of nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health. We have Gary Williams. He's professor of Department of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M University. And Barry Popkin, he is professor of economics at UNC and professor of nutrition at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. So we're going to start off, each one is going to talk a little bit about their work, and then we're going to have a discussion uh, with all of us. So let me turn to you, Walter. Okay. Well, thanks, Abby. I was just going to make a few simple points. Uh, the first being, if we judge by its impact on human health, the American food supply is a disaster. We've seen obesity rates in adults double over the last 30 or 40 years, and two-thirds of Americans are now obese or overweight. Obesity rates in children have gone up threefold or fourfold. In, in parts of the country, life expectancy is going down. We have problems. The second point is that the quality, the poor quality of our food supply is directly contributing to these problems. The Americans consume huge amounts of refined starch, sugar, uh, red meat, uh, very inadequate quantities of fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, uh, and uh, whole grain high fiber foods. We know from lots of research now that those factors are directly related to the increase in diabetes and will in the future increase risk of cardiovascular disease. And we now have very direct evidence that the quality of our food supply is directly affecting the rates of obesity in this country. So we have a, a very poor quality food supply. And the third point is that we're not really using the levers that we potentially have to make improvements in the health and well-being of Americans through better food. And that's, what, uh, this, that's why we're having the discussion about the Farm Bill. There are, are multiple ways that this might be modified to be more effective in promoting health. Uh, subsidies of food production uh, is one possibility. I'm going to let my economist friends talk about that more. Another area is the agricultural research that's being done. Basically, the agricultural research program is set up to uh, really uh, do research on promoting more of the same. And the third area where uh, much could be done is improving the food assistance programs. We have some really good programs, especially the Women, Infant, Child Program, child program that uh, does uh, very specifically promote healthy food and exclude unhealthy food. We have the school lunch program and school breakfast programs, very important programs that historically have been mostly dumping grounds for commodities. There's been work over the last 20 years to improve the nutritional quality, but that's really a work in progress. And we have, ac we have action in this week by the Senate blocking the rec scientific recommendations from the National Academy of Science to reduce the amount of potatoes in school food programs, and that was essentially overridden by the <coughs> Senate uh, just this week. But the really big issue is the SNAP program, used to be the food program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. 
And that's almost $80 billion a year. And it's mainly a conduit for us to write checks, the American public to write checks for people to buy mostly junk and soda. And uh, it's a, an essential program for many people, but the quality of what's being uh, used in this program uh, really feeds the epidemic. Uh, so there are uh, tremendous potential, uh, potentials here for improving uh, the outcome. Uh, clearly, the farm, fixing the farm bill isn't going to solve everything, but there are real possibilities, and hopefully we can take advantage of that. I want to hear more about that. David, your turn. Thank you. Well, to build on Walt's comments, uh, from a traditional perspective, humans have always eaten dozens or literally hundreds of different species throughout the year. Um, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, several grains, fish or animals if we could grow them or catch them. But they came in limited form. There's only so many ways you can process a broccoli. In the last century, there's been a progressive transformation to that traditional way of eating, such that we now have a massive number of products in our food supply. You know, think of all of the prepared breakfast cereals alone. That could be hundreds on a store shelf, uh, together with fast food, sugary drinks, a range of processed snacks. And yet, um, they're all produced from literally four commodities, uh, corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, or the animals that are fed those commodities. That's the majority of calories in our diet now. This profound transformation of the diet has been driven by agricultural policies in general, and to some degree, specifically, farm agricultural subsidies of commodities that have made these grains and soybeans that are inherently cheap to produce even cheaper, and the fruits and vegetables and other whole foods that are inherently more labor intensive and expensive, relatively even more so. The implications of this policy to public health uh, are increasingly pr profound um, for two reasons. One is that these ultra processed products based on commodities are very dense in calories. Although calorie density by itself isn't inherently a problem. Nuts are calorie dense, but they're also nutritious and satiating and have, other, and have many benefits to health. It's the combination of concentrating calories and, re and removing nutrients and other nutritional properties. So as we might have 50 years ago had a child who ate a bowl of strawberries for an afternoon snack that provided 100 calories. But those um, strawberries would have also provided five or more grams of fiber, uh, many vitamins and minerals, antioxidants and phytochemicals in physiological relevant doses. Today that child is probably eating strawberry flavored fruit gushers, um, which have the same 100 calories in a tenth the size. Virtually no fiber, um, vitamins or minerals or anything of value. The consequence are what I saw today in, my, in the obesity clinic at Children's Hospital uh, are patients like uh, the eight-year-old girl that I saw who weighed over 200 pounds with triglycerides of 240, very high, very low levels of HDL cholesterol, insulin resistance, fatty liver, and prediabetes. And this is not genetic. This is dietary. Um, ultimately, we are going to need to rethink agricultural policy to get us off of this dependence primarily on these four products in order to improve the nutritional quality of the food supply if we're going to do anything about the obesity epidemic and the epidemic of diseases related to obesity in the United States. Thank you. Gary, you're next. Well, my, my basic instinct is to sort of respond, but let me set the groundwork we'll here. We'll get a chance. <laughs> we're all going to get a chance to respond. Set the groundwork by talking a little bit about uh, farm bills, where they come from, how they, what they have to do with subsidies and nutrition. Um, farm bills are basically developed by the ag committees of both the House and the Senate in, in negotiation with the executive branch and with an increasing number of, of lobbyists' uh, interests, but not just farm lobbyists, a large number of environmental lobbyists and consumer lobbyists and conservation lobbyists, all of whom want to have something in the farm bill that, that benefits them. Farm bills began back in the 1930s when we had income problems and the, and, and the rural 
uh, sector of society was considered to be the, the poor sector of society. 20 to 25 percent of our, of our uh, employment was in agriculture, so it made some sense to jumpstart our economy by, um, by providing some transfer of income to the rural poor. And that made some sense, but what would, it was intended to be sort of a, a temporary uh, solution to a long, to, to a temporary problem became sort of an institution. I mean, every four or five years, we have another farm bill that we negotiate and debate, and an increasing number of, of interests get their fingers in that particular pie. Well, by the 1960s or so, what we found out was that, you know, we'd become very urbanized. Uh, the farm interests in Congress were, were dwindling. Uh, farmers found that they needed to find some friends in Congress on the urban side. Uh, there was interest, uh, more interest in urban sort of poor rather than the, than the rural poor now. And so we included food assistance in the farm bill and that it got the congressman online uh, and got President Kennedy to sign the bill as well. So it, it went forward from there we began, continued to have farm bills. We, we supported uh, uh, agriculture at that time by, with price supports, keeping prices high, reducing acreage and so forth. By the 1980s, we had another farm crisis. Uh, farm interests wanted to keep the farm bill going, uh, but again, now we had one to two percent of our population employed in agriculture. Even more diminished interest in Congress at continuing farm bills, and so we switched the farm bill again. And so what we did is we went to uh, uh, a subsidized kind of program that subsidized producers to produce, and they did. They produced, and they increased production, uh, and which lowered prices and provided more food. So the objective was to increase production of food and that brought congressmen online, urban congressmen, to, to sign off on the bill because this is more food at lower prices. And that's basically where we are today. We have subsidies paid to, 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 to producers. They are um, what we call countercyclical in large part. When prices go up, subsidies go down. Prices are down, subsidies go up. Uh, except for what we call direct payments which are paid to farmers for basically just being farmers. And that's where most of the uh, most of the interest is in terms of what are we doing with these subsidies. Uh, but what's really not understood is those, those, that food assistance that we, were, uh, we started back in the 1960s. If you look at this little graphic, that blue part that you see there, that is food assistance as part of the farm bill. 65%, 68% of the farm bill really goes to food assistance programs, only 15% to farm programs now. Uh, and so, the, you know, food assistance, and primarily the SNAP, uh, program, the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or food stamps, is where the majority of the farm bill kinds of subsidies are going. So when I talk about subsidies, the real subsidies being paid are for food assistance, right? Only 15% are going to the farm. And now that farm prices are so high, those countercyclical payments are, are, are gone, and we have those direct payments are really only the subsidies we're talking about right now, they're really effective uh, going on. That's where our, our, our interest is. So. Uh, uh, th what we've had, we've had a 75% increase in, in, in participation in the SNAP program since 2007 and uh, a 50% increase in our expenditures on those food stamps since that time because of low incomes, unemployment, and, and inability for people to find jobs. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Barry. Um, so I want to talk about this confluence of a number of issues. When we began the Farm Bill, it started in the 30s, but it really became massive after World War II. After, we had created much of the technology to create modern agriculture, Mendelian genetics, learning a whole lot of things about breeding and handling crops, learning about soil conservation, pesticides, insecticides, sometime between 1880 and 1940. After World War II, we decided to invest. We invested not only in the Farm Bill, but we put hundreds of billions of dollars into infrastructure, into a whole array of programs to create the food system that we know today. When we created that food system in 1950, we were making commodities. We were making basic products. If you went to a farmer's market, especially if you have a chic one like I have in North Carolina, where we have goat cheese and pork and beef and poultry and whatever you want, you would find it there. However, that's not the food system we have today. That is not the product of our farm bill, exactly. And that's one of the complexities we have to realize. We're not going to solve every food problem in America. We're not going to take the 600,000 foods, that's the number, David, that are unique UP, United Universal Product Codes in our food supply in any supermarket in America, 
21,000 are salty snack junk foods. Three-fourths are junk foods under my categorization of the amount of salty fat, saltiness, fattiness, sugar sweetens, and there's added of one sort or another. 75% have sugar sweetened, nutritive sweeteners in them today. So what you're eating today and buying is not what we produced back then. So the first question is understand where the farm bill came from, understand what would happen with it if we got rid of it or we changed it. And so we now had an agricultural protection bill and a nutrition bill. What would that do? Would Americans eat better? Or then we move to the second point. So on that first point, we created a farm system. We created checkoffs. We consolidated across all the different commodities. We have a pork checkoff, a chicken checkoff, a beef growers, et cetera. These organizations are the lobbies that perpetuate part of the farm bill today. They get hundreds of millions right directly every time you buy some piece of that wonderful food supply David talked about. So that's number one. We created in the 50s and the 60s as we evolved that. Then we had hunger in America. I was involved in that. I wrote parts of that. We wanted, we desperately needed food stamps. We had hunger across the country. We needed it. We had an inadequate welfare system. We had racism in lots of states in America. When we created the food stamp system, we had some states that would have 5% of the low income eligible getting stamps and other states 90%. We created regulations, we created rules to cover everybody. In the process, we created a somewhat inflexible system to try to deal with, with between state differences and racism and all sorts of complexities in the way state government ran things. So we created that system. But when we started food stamps, we also began with a very rational low income population. If you saw the diets of Americans in the 50s and 60s and you were low income, black or white, you ate beans, you ate vegetables, you ate starchy staples, you didn't have a lot of meat, you had a healthy diet, you didn't have a heart disease, you weren't so fat then. We had some overweight, but it was trivial compared to what we have today. So now we shift. We started with food stamps. Later, we, now we call it SNAP. We later added school feeding in the 60s and 70s because we had tons of kids going to school without breakfast. We had tons of kids who got nothing to eat for lunch. Today, those same kids that get in school breakfast may get two breakfasts now, one at home, one at school. We have, if I took you to our school and I showed you three or four papers we have coming out, what the profile is of what do you eat in a school lunch today and what you eat at fast food for a kid six to 10, they're identical. It's the same pizza, the same fried potatoes. It's, it's horrible. But will, can we change it through the food stamp program and the food farm bill? That's a very big complexity we face here when we look at what ministry, what Department of Agriculture is running, health and nutrition today, and the various forces. So that's kind of a second element you have to understand as we move forward. The only difference is WIC, which Walter noted. WIC is different because WIC was created for medical reasons and public health reasons and run through health programs. So we have two different sectors that come through. Yes, you're right about the size of it. And she's trying to cut me off. Well, yeah, I gotta to just up. there, I gotta show my three slides. So <laughs> this is how global beef prices changed between the 50s and 60s and today. In world terms, it's 20 to 30% of what it was. And we did that, we in the US and Europe. This is how starchy staples, corn, all these things in that line have gone down. And on the other hand, the top colors are fruits and vegetables, the bottom colors are sugars and oils and other things. Those are the price changes that have gone on. We did it, we created this marvelous system and we created the farm bill, we created the lobbies, we created all these programs and the question is, how do we change them within the whole set of lobbyists and other groups that we have created to run and promote these programs today? Now we're going to solve it, this, uh, right, in our forum. <laughs> and I wanted, uh, we've had lots of things thrown out here, but uh, right now, because subsidies is such a, everybody talks about subsidies and the idea we're no longer a horse and buggy farm culture, and why are we giving all this money to these big agricultural conglomerates, and they just all grow the wrong foods, and um, you know, it's the end of Western civilization. 
Gary, I want you to answer, to talk about the subsidies. They are a small part of what the farm bill costs, but let's get rid, let's, let's deal with the subsidies. Well, first, I'm not, a, I'm not a farm advocate. I'm an agricultural economist, and so, but it looks like I'm sort of being put into that role. So let me just speak to that, <laughs> sort of speak to that side of things, okay? Just, just to get that side of the, of the argument out. Here. Right, sure. <laughs> um, well, I, I think if you talk to any farmer and farm organizations, and I talk to a lot of them all the time, we did a lot of research for the checkoff organizations, which, by the way, don't <laughs> lobby. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it, no, it's, it's, let's it, stick with the question. Uh, they, uh, they would tell you that, uh, well, let me give you an, a medical analogy. You know, I, I'm getting older, I'm going to the doctor a lot these days, and they're giving me medicines, I don't know what they are. Uh, my concern is, what is the side effects? You know, are the benefits of that medicine going to be greater than the side effects? And many times I find out the side effects are just not. You know, uh, they're too high for me to, to, to keep taking the mm -hmm. medicine. And we change. We find different ways of doing things so that we can deal with the problem. Agriculture, I think, would admit there are a lot of problems with the system that we've had over the years. There's a lot of uh, unintended consequences, you might say, of, of, of the farm bill. But, but the other side is, look what we've done. I mean, uh, Walter says we've got poor quality food. I, you know, I would challenge you to go any place in the world and find a food system that provides more per capita, a better quality, more diversity, lower price, any place in the world. If you travel in Europe, uh, you, you want to come home. You know, if you travel, travel in Asia, you want to come home. You know, because, because the food price is there uh, and the quality of food that you can get is just not comparable to the choices. Sure, we've got a lot of junk food out there, but you don't have to choose it. That's, that was the other argument that we'd make is that, is that you can't blame the supply side for everything. People choose, we're, and, and they would say, we're providing a choice set out there, and what people eat's up to them. They choose what they want to eat. I, you know, I eat food that tastes good, uh, and, and Walter. healthy stuff is not good. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, you'll have to come with me on my next trip yeah. to Italy. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you see, I can't it's, eat it's, pasta it's, and, it's, and it's, uh, sauce. So yeah. There's lots of choices there and you don't go. have to eat pasta. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think this argument that, uh, which the food industry, as you said, makes, that uh, we'll produce whatever people want to eat. Uh, uh, that, and there is some truth to that, of course, but there is still fundamentally, I, th I guess the point that Abby made, that it's got to be available and it's got to be affordable. And the problem is, it's really, as uh, Barry showed, uh, for many Americans, uh, what is affordable and available is junk. It is the refined starch, it is the sugar, not many fruits and vegetables, whole grain, nuts, and the things that really make us healthy. So I think that is really the big challenge, and we need to work together. Uh, I think the challenge is how can we design a system that can produce generous amounts of healthy foods in ways that are available and affordable. And uh, there, there has to be a way to do that. I, I, I know there is, but this, our present system is not doing that. I just end up on, when I finish this story, uh, questions about subsidies. Yeah, I'm going to stick uh, that uh, up here. I want to subsidies. Like, like, here we have subsidies for the farm industry. And the question is, are we, we subsidizing the wrong farmers, the wrong crops, the wrong land? Um, me, and there's a, there's a, the let thing Let me talk in the about that, because I but, wanted to address that point. We thought in 1950 we were addressing the right farmers. We believed in animal protein. We believed the world needed basic commodities. Our, we ignored all the other things. We ignored the pulses, the beans, the produce, the, all the kinds of stuff that we know today are healthy because we thought we were doing the right thing. The problem is, as science changed, we've created this system of changing the, and distorting the relative prices. So what essentially is cheap today is is what we made cheap. And what is expensive today is what we ignored to some extent. Now, I'm not saying we could have made beans dirt cheap, and I'm not saying we could have made produce as cheap, but we could have made them cheaper, and we could have made some of the other foods less, relatively less, uh, uh, more expensive. We distorted what we call in economics the relative prices of different foods, not only in the US, we did it across the globe now. And that indeed is part of what's feeding into the food system that concerns all of us th when we're talking about. But is that, that connected to subsidies? Do subsidies yes. do that? How subsidies, do subsidies had do that? a major role in creating cheaper animal source foods across the globe. 
you go to any meeting of our, the rate of returns on the research, not just pure subsidies, the whole infrastructure of investment in research. I don't want to give it all to the Farm Bill because that's a tiny piece of the amount of money we invested between 1950 and 80 in real terms in creating the cheap system. Farm bills are own, farm subsidies are just a piece of it. And, and if we removed it today, I'd be naive to think, given the research that some in the audience and I have seen, it will only take away some benefits from the agribusinesses. It will not uh, help the food prices we face. It will not change anything. So, Gary, do you, do you believe that by changing the subsidies or is, is, you know, switching one subsidy for another? Is that? I think there's no question that, that our subsidies have, have allowed more food production. And it's, it's, well, one of the things that we don't understand a lot of is that right when we were also establishing those farm bills back in the 1930s, we were setting up marketing orders and marketing agreements that affected fruit and vegetable production, the perishables. We, we say, well, we didn't subsidize perishables. Well, yeah, we did. We had these marketing orders and marketing agreements that allowed farmers to control the supply of the fruits and vegetables, allowed them higher prices to innovate uh, and, and to develop new technologies uh, just the way we were doing over fruits and, and grains and livestock. So it's somewhat incorrect to say we were only subsidizing our, our, our grains and livestock. We were also doing the same thing in fruits and vegetables. So that's sort of, sort of one thing. And the other thing is that for most of the history of Farm Bill, we were, we were subsidized farmers by raising prices by buying the commodities off the market and keeping prices high, not lowering. It wasn't until about the <laughs> 1980s that we actually got into the business of lowering prices through our, through our, through our uh, farm bills. And so I would argue that since then, yeah, we may have some argument that we've reduced the prices, but we've also been doing those sort of things in fruits and vegetables. And, and that if we took away the farm programs, as, as he was talking about, I think most farmers would say, look, <laughs> we're in a dead heat war with the rest of the world. We were fighting subsidies in Europe. We're fighting subsidies in Brazil. We're fighting subsidies by China now in, in these pernicious undervaluation of the exchange rates, which benefits their farmers and creates havoc for our farmers by lowering prices. We're an export-oriented industry, keeps our prices down, and really hurts farmers. So I think one of the things we would say is that, well, okay, yeah, we need to keep a, a strong agriculture or we're going to lose it the way we lost the textile industry, we've lost the steel industry, you know, we're, we're, we're dependent on oil. The last thing we want to be is dependent on food, right? And, and, and so it's important that we, we do that. It's a national security interest, I think people would argue, that we have a strong agriculture. There have been unintended consequences. And so, but to put the blame all at the feet of farmers in the Midwest, I think is really uh, a, a sort of, an, uh, I don't want to say naive, but sort of a, uh, uneducated way of thinking about things. We've done uh, a lot of investing in a lot of ways. We're talking here though about, and this is the important point I wanted to make, we're talking about price effects. Income effects are probably more important than the price effects in terms of what's going on. Low income causes people to choose low quality foods. You see this all over the world. Developing countries across the world, low income people choose to eat low quality foods because that's what's cheap, right? And we find that same sort of problem here. Low income causes people to choose low quality foods because it stretches their food dollar. Why do you think we've had that increase in, in, in applications for SNAP? Because people have an income problem right now and so they're looking for an ability to, to feed themselves. 15% of our people in this country are food insecure, meaning that at some time during the year, they don't have enough to eat. Uh, they, at least they missed at least one meal because they don't have enough income to pay for it. Well, those people are looking to survive. They're looking to, to live. And, and when their income is low, they eat what's available, right? I think, and my way of thinking as an economist, what we really could do to, if we were really worried about the health issues, not worry so much about the price effects that come from farm subsidies, which is a small part of what's going on, and think more about how we boost income levels. Because around the world, whenever you increase incomes, people choose a better quality diet. Their income goes up, and we choose, so if we do a better job at reducing our rate of unemployment, we do a better job at getting our prices down, we, we do a better job of uh, investing in human capital, uh, education and training, we can raise people's income and that'll do a whole lot more uh, at uh, dealing with poor choices in food than anything we could do with eliminating farm subsidies. But let's stick with these poor choices of food. I mean, I think all of us want to have higher incomes. That's good, I mean, uh, and that will solve a lot. 
but here we are. We have a lot of people who depend on SNAP and depend on food assistance. And we've heard uh, for a whole lot of reasons that uh, the choice of food is unhealthy. What can legislation or what can policy do to, in a sense, influence people's choices? Okay, David. Well, I'd like to take that question and bring it back to the mother of the eight-year-old I saw in clinic today. She um, told me that uh, her eight-year-old daughter doesn't watch a lot of TV but has a few favorite shows, and one is Ike Harley. And she said, but, you know, I take her shopping, and all she wants to eat are foods with the Ike Harley. The parent, I didn't know this. There's some Ike Harley imprint uh, icon that characterizes certain foods. And her daughter wants it. And she said, and I've noticed that all those foods are placed at eye level for her. So we have, yes, um, the low cost of commodities is a factor. And certainly low income is a, is a huge overriding factor. But let's not forget the impact of marketing and advertising. The uh, food industry, especially the big conglomerates, have enormous incentive to advertise commodity-based foods because they extremely cheap to make. You can, you know, trademark them. You know, you can't patent, you know, trademark a broccoli, but you can trademark you know, Fruit Loops. And this advertising is driving food choice and driving down nutritional quality uh, throughout the population. And because of the political influence of the industry, we lack regulation to protect young children from manipulative advertising, which the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Psychological Association state are unfair for children. So I think the first step here is to you know, have the public's voice heard in the legislative process um, rather than the special interests in establishing policies beyond agricultural subsidies that relate to food quality in the United States. So if we're talking about how, how to craft a food assistance program, um, you know, certainly marketing of foods and, and certainly taste. And uh, as a working mother, you know, sometimes the fast foods are really uh, convenient. Um, but let's, let's, let's go to the question of um, how you would craft legislation in the food assistance programs to influence healthy behavior, healthy food. I mean, how do you do that legislation? A little Barry? Well, having studied prices around the world uh, and price elasticity, we call it, <coughs> sensitivity of price changes to what you buy, we certainly know that some foods are more sensitive. For example, sugar-sweetened beverages, certain other foods, if you change the prices, people will consume them less or more depending on which direction the prices go in there. And the people are very sensitive. There are other products where we're less sensitive, basic staples that we need to keep ourselves alive. We need them no matter what, and we buy those before we buy some of the less essential and others. So we studied, for example, with sugar-sweetened beverages in four different countries here. We followed 5,000 people as they moved across the country from living in four major regions to every state in America. And we found their prices as they changed. When the prices went up, they consumed less soft drinks. Prices went down, they consumed more. It changed their weight significantly, we showed. It changed their risk of diabetes. These factors could matter. That would require us to have a nutrition bill that concerned with public health and and then there are lots of things that would come into that, as David said. And where incomes would come in and incomes policy to the question of food choice and getting proper food choice, I'm not clear because I've been following uh, 30,000 Chinese, which we study every couple of years for three days. We measure everything they consume. Their incomes are going up. Their diets are getting worse and worse. The food system's changing around them. They're getting more and more of the same wonderful food supply we're getting, and they're getting fatter. We have higher risk of diabetes in Chinese children 7 to 18 today than we do in U.S. children. So I don't think income alone would do it unless we have a public health component of our policy that cares about prices, cares about marketing, and some of these other issues. I think we have a long way to, we have a long way to get a good food, is good farm bill, but let's open this up to questions. We have questions uh, from the audience and we have questions online. Uh, let's start with the audience. Some questions. 
I'm Lillian Chung, Editorial Director of Harvard School of Public Health Nutrition website, The Nutrition Source. Thank you for all your insights. One issue that um, we, not too long ago is that May and Bloomberg got rejected the exemption to apply for not allowing SNAP dollars to uh, purchase sugar-sweetened beverages. And the reason is that USDA thought that the implementation process is very difficult. How can we move the needle forward on it? What are some of the ways that you would suggest that can be done? Um, Wal Walter. Well, I this was really upsetting that uh, the New York City petition was rejected there because we're writing checks with one hand for billions of dollars of years, uh, billions of dollars per year, uh, to buy soda in, within the food stamp uh, SNAP program, and then again we're with the other hand writing checks for treating diabetes. It just is nuts. Uh, so uh, to not allow New York to do this, even on a trial basis, that's all I asked for was just a trial basis. Uh, was uh, ridiculous, and the excuses the USDA gave were just completely lame. They said, oh, stores can't do it. Well, they're already uh, uh, not allowing SNAP cards to be used for other products, uh, alcoholic beverages, warm foods, dog food, things like that. They can easily do it with the barcodes we have. I, I think it, it may just take outrage and political pressure from the American public who should be fed up with this practice. Uh, at the same time, we really do need to preserve the SNAP program. This is an essential policy for families to be able to have enough to eat. Yeah, but remember, the SNAP program is intended to, to allow people to be food secure. It never was intended to increase the nutritional content of the food. And that's one of those unintended nutritional it, yeah, assistance Yes, it's what it's called, but, it's but that's not what it necessarily yeah, but, does. Yeah, but Gary, it's a little trickier because when we started the SNAP program in the 60s, low-income Americans ate very healthy diets and we designed it because of that, it started off where we were going to restrict a million and one things and we had a number of different issues. We removed them because we found they were more rational than the rest of us and that they bought a healthier diet than the rest of Americans. Now we fast forward 50, 60 years, we have not changed the guidelines of SNAP, the rules when it comes to that. However, when it comes to something where the Department of Agriculture has a commodity group like wanting to sell produce in a farmer's market, they get extra experiments and we're doing experiments across America in farmer's markets for some products. Something has gone wrong that we don't understand where we won't test restrictions in the way we used to. SNAP began with tons of restrictions that liberal America removed. So we did it ourselves. Those of us who cared about hunger said they're smarter than we are. We shouldn't restrict them. So I don't think we, we couldn't come back to that again. I think the, name, the problem has changed, the marketing has changed, the price structure has changed, and it, we just need to think of SNAP. And we need to do it in a way that won't threaten it because it is the safety net of America. For low-income America, it's not as trivial as Walter says. There's nothing else if you're unemployed and have nothing. And so that's the critical problem. We can't lose SNAP. We have nothing. And well, whether we call it food stamp or welfare, it is our safety net. Absolutely. Uh, David, I want to ask you if, you, if in a perfect world you could put in three restrictions <laughs> on food, you know, on SNAP of what to buy, what would they be for, for a healthy, healthy food for children? Well, we actually recently wrote a commentary <laughs> <and> jam <laughs> on this topic, um, so I can just uh, refer. I think the sugar-sweetened beverages are an obvious place to start. Um, we calculated that each day the government and taxpayers uh, pay for the purchase of 20 million servings of sugar-sweetened beverage. That's per day. And that is arguably the single most important contributor as a single food to obesity and related chronic diseases. You know, as Walter said, it makes no sense that we're spending $4 billion a year for that one product, which has, even if you debate its relative contribution to the obesity epidemic, nobody's saying it's good for kids' teeth or bones or health. Um, and so it makes no sense to be paying for that, especially when we might wind up paying for that as a society um, through the increased costs of obesity-related disease. Next restriction. 
Well, I think you know your point is, is 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 perhaps I'm inferring. Some have argued that it's a slippery slope. You know, once you start one restriction, should we do candy? And if we do candy, you know, who's to decide? Should we do white bread? And the hunger, um, the advocates uh, for um, hunger in America want to avoid stigmatizing poor people. I'm not saying that the answer is clear in the middle ground, but at the extremes, in the case of sugar-sweetened beverages, to me that's black and white, and then we can have an informed debate as to how to update this policy, this program, which was so instrumental 50 years ago when obesity was one-fourth the prevalence, how to update that to today's nutritional environment when the ratio of overweight and obesity to underweight in children is seven to one. Right, but what I'm pressing you on is, is how specifically in a farm bill would you put in language that's going to change eating patterns either by, uh, good, you got it. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, uh, the good thing is, is we do have a really well-designed, well-run program by the USDA, the WIC program, that uh, the National Academy of Sciences has reviewed the description of a healthy package that is supported by this program. Uh, there's very positive feedback from participants in this mm -hmm. program. And one of the really good outcomes is that it actually changes availability of what's there in the small stores because if you can only get healthy whole grain breakfast cereals, that's what the, the stores will have there. So uh, we don't have to look very far and, and be totally theoretical that we've got a really good program. Uh, I think I feel really good about supporting that program. Participants feel good about uh, being research. in it, and people and their kids are getting uh, are, are really benefiting by uh, it. I don't know, but what does the research say about the relationship between the WIC program and improved nutrition? Is there? Oh yeah, that's been that very well happening? documented. Yes. Yeah. Now, how yeah. would you translate that into the broader food stamp or a food assistance program? I mean. You can have the same criteria, they yeah. use cards the same it, way. Yeah. The it's difficulty it. is the, what David mentioned. Once we go beyond sugar-sweetened beverages, juices, and some products where we have pretty clear evidence, it, we, the, 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 the science isn't there as much, but we do know what to support. We know to promote whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables, certain kinds of other beverages. Other, what we can, we don't need to, the food stamp or SNAP now doesn't support everything that low-income Americans buy. But if we say it's used for these 60 or whatever it is, types of foods, it would change the structure of diet for low-income America. I do not know what to ban beyond sugar-sweetened beverages. <laughs> I wish I could say, let's get rid of salty snacks and junk food, <laughs> and it will reduce weight and reduce the risk of diabetes. But it, we don't have as much research on it as we do on sugar-sweetened beverages. Yeah. It was a question here. Snacks. You have a question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Ann Kim. I'm a Master of Science two-year uh, student here at Harvard School of Public Health in Health Policy. My question is um, twofold. Uh, first is, um, what what can you do, or what can be done, so that subsidies in the farm bill do go to, let's say, uh, marketing at eye level for the little kid um, broccoli that looks so delicious that you just want to eat it, uh, you know? Because it sounds to me like a lot of these kids are watching. Um, and being influenced by things that they see, then shouldn't, uh, what kind of, is it politically feasible and how can we make it politically feasible for that kind of uh, subsidy to go in uh, into place? And then um, the reason that a lot of EBT in um, uh, for SNAP happens to be, uh, happens to ban liquor and et cetera is, of course, because it doesn't add to your nutritional, you know, uh, intake, but also because that's what's sold at liquor stores and at really uh, pretty much any place. But um, what can you do to incentivize liquor stores and those um, points of entry for um, food resource lacking areas to be able to have those more whole foods that are perishable in comparison to things that are packaged that can be kept on the shelf long enough uh, for sale? 
And then thirdly, uh, I'd like to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I stop? Okay. Why, don't you, why don't you wait in your last part of the question and let someone try to to, to answer? Gary, why don't you well, answer? You know, I'm start. I'm no food scientist, so I, I I can't tell you a lot of the answer to your question. But but here's what I do know as an economist: that every time the government gets involved in the market. Every time the government makes an intrusion into the market, there are inefficiencies and costs to be paid. There are unintended consequences. I mean, we just, we understand that. Uh, and, but what we hope is that the benefits of that outweigh any of the costs associated with it. And the problem is when we, we get down to this level of trying to mandate exactly what food companies can and can't do in advertising, you know, we may feel good about it, but there are always these unintended consequences. They're gonna find ways to do what, what you know the market is going to is going to require them to do and that that's sort of my segue back to Barry <laughs> uh, well and clearly we distort the markets right now right. across the globe there's not a single country in the world including this one that hasn't changed the prices we face for different goods and hasn't changed the nature of the game so the question is and again we face it we would like to change the farm bill, so part of it was concerned with nutrition and public health, and part of it was concerned with survival of agriculture, and separate the two, but that creates major political issues, whether they can survive either on their own, and so that may not happen. So then the question is whether it can or not, and I don't want to get into that practicality, can we change the food part so we can deal with it? WIC has really showed us we can do it. We have found, as soon as we found that the WIC package was leading to certain kinds of weight changes or wasn't good enough on X, Y, or Z, we had groups, we studied it, we changed it. The last change is the most recent. We've done it. We've never been able to change school feeding to make it healthier because we never put money in or we didn't truly try with the right heart and emphasis, and it's a monster, and it's we put so little money into our school food program today compared to what it costs to eat that fast food is, a, is what most schools use in, their, in the food. But for SNAP, and if we funded properly school feeding, we could do it. We could make them healthier, and I think we all know that. It's just the will to go with what we know is... Well, I think it, we may be talking about something that really isn't much of an issue because the farm subsidies are, gonna, are likely to go away anyway. I mean, I don't think there's any hope for far on the farm side that direct subsidies, the direct payments are going to stay. Given our budget uh, situation we have now, I think everybody pretty much in the farm sector believes direct payments are gone. And given the high prices we now have in agriculture, and it's not the farm bill that's doing it, uh, those farm prices are high and it has nothing to do with subsidies. You're, you're talking about... Uh, demand for ethanol, you're demanding a lot of things that are driving up prices in agriculture have nothing to do with the farm bill. Uh, those, so we're not paying subsidies uh, and these other programs. Those are all going to go away as well. I mean, it's easy to, to do away with those because there's no need for them now. Under, we tried that once in 96, they came back again because one, <laughs> one of the important laws of economics is what goes up comes down. And uh, when those prices are going up, uh, farmers produce full out, right? And when they produce full out, prices are going to come down. But right now, the, con the conditions are such that but we're, we're ready to get rid of all those subsidies. So the subsidies we're going to talk about in the Farm Bill from now on, I don't think are going to be so much farm subsidies as we're going to talk about conservation program subsidies in the soil, uh, farm, uh, forest service subsidies, uh, commodity uh, 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 crop insurance kinds of subsidies where we're helping farmers not to produce but to eliminate the inherent instability in the markets that's not good for consumers or producers in terms of weather and disease and all those sorts of things. That's what the farm bill is going to be on the farm side. The real subsidies are going to be food subsidies. And so if we're going to talk about how we design a farm bill to be better in terms of nutrition, it's not going to be farm subsidies that really I think is going to be the issue. The issue is going to be how do you get SNAP uh, in a place where it doesn't create obesity. All the research that I've read and granted, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a real scientist. I'm an economist. What I've seen is that, is that SNAP has been found to create obesity. Why? You know, I can't, I don't know why that is, but, but it does. So how do we change SNAP? I think it's difficult. I think that there's a real problem. I think we, maybe what we need to do is separate out and have a separate nutrition program that does focus on how do we incentivize 
consumers to consume fruits and vegetables because the shortest law in economics is incentives matter. And if you could give them incentives, they will do it. And that's the problem. What incentives then are we going to get? We can't just say we need to do it because that won't work. We need to provide incentives. And if we try to target the programs, we have another set of unintended consequences. If we're going to tell consumers uh, on SNAP, this is all you can consume, these healthy foods, we're going to find, number one, participation drop, and number two, prices on those goods going up and, and causing relative price increases on healthy price goods, and, and, and those who don't participate in SNAP or low income are going to find higher prices uh, on, on healthy goods as well. I mean, these are the kinds of things economists sort of debate back and forth in their, in their journals about what's going to happen if we try to target in terms of the unintended consequences of the program. So David. you need to think about some of those things. Uh, yeah, so incentive matters. But coming back to the first part of the question, marketing matters too, especially when it comes to children. You know, they're biologically designed to eat the things that they see people they respect eating, be they sports stars or cartoon characters. We have hundreds of millions, you know, over a billion dollars a year easily, being directly or indirectly um, targeted on young children to get them to eat the highest calorie, lowest quality foods imaginable. And when a kid starts nagging their parents, I mean, I got a three-year-old at home, and you know, it takes my wife and I, who are both, you know, we're, our lives are around food. You know, it, it takes a lot of work to guide a child in this food environment. And when busy working parents um, are undermined by this massive marketing campaign, they come home, the kids are begging for something, where they go to the supermarket and they're trying to select the healthy foods and the kids are nagging them. We know, the industry knows that the parents are going to cave. And yes, that's going to have... Haven't changed. That, but <laughs> that the, the government's role here isn't, in my view, to start advertising in competition to the food industry. That will never work. We don't have enough money there. The government's role is to regulate. We set a, a, a fair... Uh, battlefield for the food industry. They can compete with each other on fair ground and let them compete um, to make healthy foods. Once the government sets that rules of fair play, which include no advertising, in my view, of any kind to young children, the, f the pressure will be off. And that single change alone, I think, will dramatically change the food supply. Let's have a question from online. Do you have an qu online yes, question? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Robin Herman. I'm director of the forum. And um, one of the features of the forum is that we can take questions from our online viewers. And um, you can also watch the forum on your mobile phone and, and other mobile devices. So we have a question from um, a farmer, an attorney and dairy farmer in Herkimer County, uh, New York. Her name is Lorraine Lewandrowski. And she's concerned with the, the, the demonizing, really, of uh, of farmers and um, grouping together of small uh, rural um, or medium-sized um, farm uh, production with the uh, agribusiness. And she feels that the medium-sized farmers have a lot of research that they could, um, they could contribute to uh, improving the nutrition of, of the country. And uh, asks this, this uh, question that's important, what is it that urban America wants for the future of rural America. All right, Barry, yes. Um, <laughs> clearly, the Farm Bill started off being concerned with our, our farmer from New York State and that, and the nature of farm system in America has changed vastly. We didn't have Archer Daniel Midlands and Cargills and Purdue Farms and Tysons, and we didn't have dominant players in each sector that determine the kind of food and marketing that exists today. And it has nothing to do with that farmer. And to demonize small farms, clearly in Michael Pollan's American for this audience, we're trying to push farmers markets and small farmers and all of that. Will it feed America? Will it solve America's nutritional and obesity problems? No. That's really the question. What do we do with that small farmer and the farmers in America that will produce cheap, affordable, healthier food for every American. And that is what we've been talking about, and it's not easy. And it isn't, and it could also has to be incentivizing Archer Daniel Midland and Cargill and Kraft and Nestle to produce healthy food, because we're not going to get rid of them. Mm, this is the biggest commercial sector in the globe, the but food couldn't, industry. Couldn't a, couldn't a farm bill 
uh, provide subsidies, you know, targeted to small small farmers or organic farmers or local farmers that are providing local <laughs> healthy food? Well, they do. I mean, we, we do that. In fact, over the history of the Farm Bill, uh, they've worked hard on trying to find ways of focusing subsidies to the family farm. And family farm was the big issue, right? Well, family farmer, family farmer, until we realized that we don't know what a family farm is anymore because so many of them are incorporated uh, to mm -hmm. protect themselves against litigation and everything else that's going on, particularly you, know, you dairy farmers out there you're talking about, they've been litigated to death. And, and that's the problem is we don't know what a family farm is. Many of those corporate farms are demonizing, they're really families trying to make business. They're successful, some of them are very big because they've been very successful, but that doesn't mean they're the problem. Uh, there, there are corporate, very big corporate businesses that maybe we might feel like demonizing, but, but I sympathize with you. That, that's exactly the problem is that, uh, is that farmers aren't necessarily the problem. They've responded to incentives and they've done what we've asked them to do. They've created a food supply and we now have fewer farms that are much more productive. I mean, we have the highest yields uh, in the world of any product or practice that you can think about, uh, increasing productivity, uh, and they've done that through technology adoption. It hasn't been the farm bill. It's been, you know, them out there making themselves profitable, being efficient, adopting technologies, and, 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 and taking a, a advantage of economies of scale. Uh, and then we turn around and we say, gee, you haven't done the right things. You know, you, you're bad because you're producing the foods we don't want. Well, that's what we told them to do. Can I add but this one is America, point yeah. to Gary? Uh, mm -hmm. Farmers and small farmers today are not the one getting the subsidies. When we were setting up and we had a number of meetings with the, the concerned and we brought in economists that studied the subsidies and who gained them, the bulk of the subsidies, are, when we were looking at the changing the farm bill, went to those huge agribusiness consortium. They could say, when you looked at the poultry sector, the hundreds of millions went to the Purdue and Tyson. When you looked at the beef, you looked at the grain. So I think we'd be misguided that today to think that the benefits of the subsidies are coming to the small farmers. I wish they were. Now you're talking about the benefits, not the subsidies. The subsidies, subsidies don't go to the Tysons. The subsidies Tysons don't go don't. to those groups. The benefits in terms of the, the profits. Prices that are being lower. Okay. Right. Let's be clear on and that. And it was the total <laughs> profitability and who gained from the farm controls of the farm bill. He's correct. The only subsidies that go go to farmers mm -hmm. or corporations farmers. More questions? Yes. Michelle Mello, I'm a professor of law and public health here at the School of Public Health. Could you talk to us a little bit about the controversy over high fructose corn syrup? Are our farm policies responsible for the <laughs> wide availability and use of this corn syrup, and is it disproportionately to blame for the obesity problem? Or should we believe the advertising we're seeing on TV now that sugar is sugar? <laughs> well, I believe the advertising. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> Walter, I can respond Walter, a little yes, bit to that. Yes, I guess yes. that's the one thing I've heard from television that actually is probably credible <laughs> in all of this. That <laughs> it is sugar is sugar, yes. And uh, from a standpoint of obesity, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's so-called natural sugar from sugar cane or from high fructose corn syrup. Uh, it, it and uh, I probably the subsidies, the systems we've heard about, have reduced the price of high fructose corn syrup, which is why it's so available. And again, the low cost probably helps increase the consumption. But in reality, probably that's not the underlying uh, problem because the amount of sugar in a 12 ounce Coke is probably two or three cents. It's something very, less, very tiny fraction. And so if you double that or cut in half, it's not gonna have any impact on the price of the, of the product. So I, I think that is a bit of a distraction. I'll just add a point. I'm the one, probably one, who's responsible for the high fructose corn syrup You're bugaboo. The <laughs> we wrote the article that got the demonized when we thought at one point with the sugar sweetened <laughs> beverage huge increases and it was all high fructose corn syrup in America. And fructose has certain metabolic uh, ways that we handle it such that we don't, we metabolize it in the liver and it has different effects. It turns out any fructose. Cane sugar, honey, high fructose corn syrup, they all act the same, we think, today with <laughs> modern science. God knows what will come in five years. But the reality is, so therefore, we think it's any fructose, any sugar. 
I don't care whether it's fruit juice concentrate, which what you'll get in half of your foods if you go to Whole Foods, or cane sugar or high fructose corn syrup you'll get if you go to some other kind of lower cost kind of market. It's all the same. So yeah, I, I just right. briefly add that it's also the, the glucose, which is another sugar, <laughs> um, you know, ain't a panacea for no, you either. No, it's not a no, fault. No. Well, you know, should, should we drink Diet Coke? I mean, is that the answer? Well, that's, 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 that's <laughs> the latest debate, you know, because the consumption of diet beverages has gone up uh, about yeah. tenfold because of the attention given to sugar-sweetened beverages. It sort of makes sense that if we take the calories out and put in these artificial high-intensity sweeteners, we'll lose weight. The irony is that despite the fact that these products have the word diet, that's never been proven in a single randomized controlled trial. And there's observational study that, uh, no, you know, getting rid of sugar sweetened beverages is a good thing. As to whether <laughs> diet beverages are uh, as good as water or actually cause problems themselves, we don't know. And uh, research just out of the obesity society that Barry and I attended found taste receptors, the things that make things seem sweet when we eat them, on fat cells. And those taste receptors respond to concentrations of saccharin that are obtained after drinking three or four diet beverages in a day. Those stimulation of those taste receptors cause those fat cells to differentiate and take in more fat. We don't know yet. So words, I think that ultimately, works. ultimately, <laughs> advertising works. Too. The only safe <laughs> beverage we know is the one that has undergone evolutionary randomized controlled testing, <laughs> and that's that's water. As to whether <laughs> diet beverages will be safe or not, in terms of body weight and chronic disease, we don't know yet. Yeah. And we need the we, trials. We just finished one six-month random controlled trial on water versus diet beverages versus sugar-sweetened beverages. David's got some undergoing or un in process or along. One of the interesting things, well, water did better, diet, obviously, both diet and water reduced the risk of all sorts of weight gains and other kind of cardiometabolic problems. But we have some suggestive findings we don't understand yet, and it's going to take serious research of two sorts. One, when you consume diet sweeteners, you seem to consume some extra sugary beverages and foods, other sugary foods. Is that a sweetness habituation and we like sugar and we want more? We don't know. Is it this biological response in the cells that David's talking about? We don't understand it. And it's one of the big global experiments, just like removing sodium from the food supply, adding all these diet sweeteners, which are really exploding in Europe, Europe and the US in consumption. We don't really know what it's going to do, and it's very scary. Our food supply, we study toxicology. You can be accepted and sold as a food if you don't kill us directly. We have no idea of the public health effects of all the sweeteners we're adding in the way we're talking now, which is a much more subtle and profound effect on our whole food pattern. So as a, so a non-food scientist, what I'm hearing you saying is... Water. Uh, well, it says is <laughs> that, well, that no matter what I drink that's got sugar in, it's going to make me fat. And none, if, if it's sugar or non-fructose corn syrup, it still doesn't matter. So it comes down to choice by consumers, right? It's the consumer <laughs> choice. It doesn't, it's not the price that's the issue. It's what the consumers are choosing. And advertising does work. It makes us consume diet sodas. And I think another sodas, issue is, right? is, is the boredom issue. You know, water is a little boring, <laughs> and uh, and this is the thing with foods also. What's ex an exciting food, and that's what people yeah. like to, to buy. So how are you going to legislate people to buy maybe not such exciting <laughs> foods, or are you going to have a massive marketing yeah. campaign that makes yeah. these foods exciting? See, I'm sitting here with all these skinny people, and uh, <laughs> and, and what what I what no. I know is that all the good stuff is the bad for you. That's what I know. <laughs> We're doing a lot better than the Republican debate. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're not like Mitt Romney. You get a chance to speak once yeah. <laughs> that, you're, We have room for one more yeah. question. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Predrag Stojic. I'm from Serbia. Um, I'm an MPH student. Uh, and I want to really address your argument that it's a matter of income. Uh, coming here to to United States, the first thing that I notice in a, getting into a supermarket is that vegetables and fruits are really, really expensive. And it's not the case in Serbia, I can assure you. It's uh, it's the opposite thing. You know, poor people are eating fruits and vegetables in Serbia because you can buy them really, really cheap, and uh, those who have more money would eat uh, meat and get fatter at, at at one point. So there is something about it, and there it's not just about you're looking at a situation 
if it's if you look at from this point you will say the income will change things but what can you do to reverse things to actually get where where it where it first be before the before those uh, legislators were coming like in the 30s or 60s you know what can you do to to reverse things to become better well, that's a good question uh well, in Serbia, the per capita income is a whole lot higher than a lot of countries. They're subsistence farming, subsistence people, and that, and and so you do have uh, a better choice set in, in Serbia than other places. Plus, it has to do a lot with what you, what's your, what's your weather like, what's your climate, what is your, what can you produce, where's your comparative advantage, and and we can produce a lot more grains and 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 uh, livestock than we can fruits and vegetables. You grow fruits and vegetables, some in California. Arizona, some of Texas and Florida, they're limited in terms of water and technology, uh, you know, that they can adapt. And, and, and politically, they're very, it's a very difficult industry to work in in California and places. So and that just makes it so that our fruits and vegetables are high priced. I mean, we, don't, we can't produce fruits and vegetables in the Midwest. I mean, anybody who thinks we could just take, take all our corn <laughs> and soybeans out of the Midwest and plant that with carrots and broccoli, you know, the weather's not there. We can't do that, it doesn't work. You know, so so we're going to grow. <laughs> well, we're going to grow. We're going to grow in the Midwest. Anyway, you got two Wisconsinites on here, right. yeah. and we grow where we grow and a lot of dairy them. and cheese, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and so we're going to grow what the comparative advantage tells us that the weather and the soils and the extensive nature of agriculture allows us to produce. You're not going to produce strawberries on a large scale in places where it doesn't belong, where it can't grow. So, so a large part of why prices are the way they are has to do with where you can grow it, where you can't. We don't grow sugar here because we don't, uh, we don't have the soils and the climate to do it. We import sugar, right? So if sugar is the problem, uh, then it's certainly not the farm bill, it's certainly not our producers. We produce some sugar, but it's disappearing uh, very rapidly uh, in this country uh, in terms of our production. We import the majority of the sugar that we eat. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it on this note. And uh, I think we haven't solved everything, but we've come closer to understanding it. I want to thank all of you for being here. I especially want to thank our panelists. And uh, this has been a great forum. Thank you very much. Thank you.